Hi, and welcome to another episode of Executive Edge at Lehigh University. I'm David Welsh, and I'm very excited to have with us today a legend in investment banking and financial services, Joseph Perella. He is widely regarded as an investment banking pioneer who has advised on billions of dollars of M&A and is one of Wall Street's most revered and respected voices in finance. He is a 1964 graduate of Lehigh University who went on to obtain an MBA from Harvard and ultimately joined the Lehigh University Board of Trustees. It is my pleasure to welcome with us today, Joseph Perella. Hi, Hi Joseph. How are you doing? I'll call you Joe, is that okay? Yeah, sure, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so let me just get right into it. How did you do everything that you've done? What's the key to success? Well, you know, sometimes I look back and ask myself that same question and wonder how I got here, but uh, it was a combination of uh, several things, I would say. One, uh, the drive to succeed at something, uh, whatever I did, uh, and, you know, people I met and events that occurred along the way that weren't planned, that somehow I figured out were important and uh, pursued those things uh, wherever they might lead and uh, ended up in a good place. What in the past shaped you? What are some of the decisions that you made that created the man you are today? The things that shaped me early were things that I got from my parents and uh, immediate family uh, and some of my teachers. Uh, and they were things that were done that I didn't realize were being done at the time. Uh, for example, in grammar school, I had a hard time paying attention because things bored me. Okay. And I had a teacher in uh, the uh, seventh grade, I think it was, uh, and it was a time when schools were overcrowded and they combined classes. I was in a class 6, 7, C. Uh, meaning they combined the 6th and 7th grade, and C was Mr. Caulfield, the, the name of the teacher. And so, you know, half the room was the 6th grade, the other half was the 7th. And he quickly figured out that I had a hard time paying attention to what was going on because I had already figured out what was going on, and what they were doing was boring me. <laughs> so he created tasks for me, for example, keep me occupied and stop me from being a distraction to the other students. So we had these uh, film tapes, you know, for the entire grammar school. And so he said, I want you to go down and catalog all this and organize it. So I buried myself down in the film strip, that's what they were called, library, and set it all up and cataloged it. And as soon as I got that done, he came up with another project. So, so I, what I, I realized then was that as, as when I focused on a task, I, I shut everything else out that might have been a less constructive path and, and sort of kept me very focused. I dwell on that because it was addressing, a, let's call it a defect in my personality, which is, you know, what you call it today, attention deficit disorder. Uh, and he figured out how to do it without drugs. Parental guidance, I think, was very important. My parents always stressed the importance of education. My father happened to be an immigrant, but who had a college degree in Italy and spoke six languages. so. You know, being around someone like that, you know, I realized comparing him to other parents I was meeting along the way that my father kind of stood head and shoulders above them from an education standpoint. And uh, he always talked about the importance of education as did his father who was uneducated but realized the importance of education. You know, by the time I was finished with high school, I was clearly focused on going to college and that's what, you know, put me here at Lehigh. and. Uh, in that period of time and ultimately it was at Lehigh that I figured out that I wanted to pursue a career in business because I didn't know what I wanted to pursue when I entered. Right. Why business? Well because I, in taking courses in engineering and in arts and science and in business uh, I just did a lot better in the business courses and I look forward to going to the classes, doing the work. Uh, and uh, I didn't do well in the engineering courses and I was kind of bored uh, in the arts and science classes. So there were certain things that I liked in arts and science, but I didn't see where it would lead me post-graduation until I got to uh, the College of Business and began taking courses in accounting uh, with professors Trembley and Brady and others. Uh, and that's when I really ignited and you know got pretty much in a average in those courses. 
a rewarding life is one where you're constantly learning and you're in a constant, I use like the word feedback loop, you know, and I, I've learned from the youngest people that I brought into my organization. I remember hiring a young kid when I was building the M&A department at uh, First Boston. And, you know, one day I was whining about the outcome of something and he said, Joe, that's really great. You know, you're telling me you, had, you went in, you had a great presentation, you had a great team when you went in. But Joe, I have to ask you a question. Were you effective? And I went like, you know, hey, that's a really good question. And then there was a young fellow who's now vice chairman of Blackstone, Tom Hill, uh, who said, Joe, you know, keep in mind, and he was, you know, younger than I by at least five years. And, and he said, you know, Joe, if you look around the street, you notice that it's pretty hard to grow old gracefully in this business. And I thought, gee, that's an interesting concept. I better keep that in mind. So <laughs> I've, here I am 45 years into it, and I, I'm, I think I've done it. Uh, but I always remember Tom Hill's advice when I was then not even 35. Are you positive about the future, negative mm. about the future, neutral? What, what's your sense? When Greg Farrington was president of Lehigh, he came to see me one day and he said, well, what's happening in the world that you think is the most important thing happening today? And I said, the internet. And then he said, well, what do you think is happening that will be the most important thing tomorrow? And I said, the internet. Uh, and so, and this was way before artificial intelligence and whatnot. So when I started on Wall Street, there was no internet, okay? Uh, and look at where we are today, right. it's way beyond the internet. And I can say this with a high degree of confidence, not knowing how I fill in the blanks, that what is going on right now will affect the way a lot of things are done in this world and in business that no one here can write the scenario for. So I would say don't be afraid to embrace change. Uh, it's a concept I heard from Warren McFarland at Harvard Business School when I was a student there. And he said to us one day, the technologically aversive manager is a threat to the organization. And I, and I never lost that statement. You know, there were certain guideposts that uh, I ran into along this journey, and that's one of them. Another one, for example, was that, uh, you know, don't engage in static analysis. Uh, you know, sometimes people look at where they are, or they look at the situation they're in, and they start making judgments based on nothing changing. Right. And the, the one thing you can be sure of is that if you kind of fast forward a year or two, things will look different than the way they are today. People who you have a problem with may not be there. So don't assume you're always going to have to deal with that person who's a problem in your life, right? Uh, so there are things like that that, you know, stuck with me uh, throughout my career. How do you describe your leadership style? Again, this is one of the things I learned from Tom DeLong, uh, who was at the time a, a guy who had a profound impact on many people at Morgan Stanley, who's now a professor at Harvard Business School who, when I met, was a Mormon bishop. And he said, don't ever forget leaders work for their people. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter. I mean, they're really great generals, for example, uh, or admirals in, in the military service. And I think in the military, there are a lot of lessons in leadership. Uh, they have the most fundamental understanding uh, that they uh, are not leading a platoon, for example, or a flight. They're leading a group of people. And so uh, one of my, again, fundamentals is that I've always thought of myself as working for my team and being part of a team. So technology seems to be something that you believe, and I think a lot of people believe, is obviously mm -hmm. changing business mm -hmm. uh, and industry. What are the impacts on the financial industry? And as far as technology is concerned, you had an industry that moved basically on paper 50 years ago through pneumatic tubes or runners to uh, the digital age where things moved at the speed of light. Uh, and that had a very fundamental change. Uh, so now, uh, if you just take, for example, the legal industry, right? So the law firms hire a bunch of associates uh, and they kind of beaver away in the library researching things. You know, if you have artificial intelligence, uh, what you have is the ability of, of machines to eliminate a lot of that labor right? and, and, and sort of get the results you're looking for uh, in a lot less time with a lot less man hours or 
people hours. Oh, but that has that analysis that has implications in the financial and finance too, right? sure. Yeah, because and and you know those firms that are on the cutting edge. I'm sure a guy like Jamie Dimon, for example, who is the CEO of J.P. Morgan, who's certainly not a technologically averse manager, is probably is spending. He and his people are spending a lot of time figuring that out, whether it's in the private wealth management space. Uh, and all the other businesses they're in. So it's going to have an impact on all kinds of financial service firms out there, big and small. Do you think this ultimately adds value and grows the industry, or do you think it just becomes more sure. productive and changes? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, use whatever example you want. It's just, uh, let's say you were building carriages and another person was breeding horses for transportation. Okay. So along came, you know, Henry Ford. All right now, Henry Ford created a lot of value to the society, uh, to the people who were employed at Ford, uh, but he also destroyed a lot of value for, uh, for people who were making carriages and horse breeders, right? And people who made horseshoes, right? Uh, so you know this. But this the world is, adjusts, and yeah, and that's why you know to me this system that we have is the best because. There's a, a, so many decisions. Have you ever watched the Milton Friedman yep. description of capitalism where he starts with a, a, a wooden pencil and talks about all the different things in the pencil and you know where the rubber comes from, where the metal comes from, where the wood comes from, where the so-called lead comes from. You know, he describes with this very simple thing. He said, now imagine, how could anybody sitting in a government bureaucracy plan what I just described has to be put together in order to create this one little thing, a pencil. So, you know, that to me is one of the greatest <laughs> lessons in capitalism that I've ever seen. People who don't embrace this uh, will be left behind. You, you really uh, need uh, people who are educated to be agile and to be flexible. flexible rather than, uh, you know, let's say educated 50 years ago to work on an assembly line, because we have robots doing a lot of that today. Uh, and, and, you know, that's really fundamental. And people have to understand that in every decision there's a second and third order consequence. And a lot of times you don't know what they are, and a lot of times they're bad. So that flexibility um, and being able to focus not necessarily on a specific job, or a specific mm -hmm. industry even, almost it's the focus on being flexible. Yeah, it's, it's what you have to learn by doing a job uh, is that you should have as a goal what Martin Luther King said once to a group of school kids in Philadelphia, one of his less famous speeches, he said, if you're going to be a street sweeper in Philadelphia, you should try to be the best street sweeper that there is. You need to have somehow de develop this pursuit of excellence, uh, which he really described in that simple speech to grammar school kids. What advice, in a sentence or two, would mm. you give to yourself, knowing what you know and all the success that you've had? I would say understanding the importance of the human dimension of life, of the importance of education, and the pursuit of excellence. What is Mr. Perella's executive edge? Identify your strengths and stay focused. Embrace technology and change. Value learning and feedback. Work for your people and always pursue excellence. To delve deeper into any of these topics, please check out our recommended reading list. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for future episodes of Lehigh's Executive Edge.